said that we must defeat self-perpetuating rule. And to defeat self-perpetuating rule, we must have somebody who's got power hungry. Therefore, the presidential candidate will also make commitment just to serve for three years. Even though the Constitution says five years. As an example, because if the person serves for three years, then we will come with the constitutional reform so that we will establish a two-year term. Five, five, two year, five, five, two terms. And that was the agreement. The person to stand as an independent candidate and the person to serve three years and constitutional reform to take place so that no president will serve more than two terms again. We agreed on that and started the process of national reconciliation. The country was divided, insults everywhere. The incumbent then had insulted one of the, or the main ethno-linguistic group. And that led to anger, led to insults on the other side. And even when we started our campaign, those insults continued. We saw that that will divide our forces. We educated everyone on the campaign trail that yes, the incumbent could insult an ethno-linguistic group. Yes, those who deemed to belong to that group could continue the insult, but we will remain divided, and divided will be weak. That it was necessary to embrace the principles of the republic, the principles of democracy, to accept we were all sovereign citizens with one vote and every vote counts. So therefore we should unite on the basis of our citizenship and avoid using a language that will disunite us. In that way, we will cement our unity to be able to defeat the incumbent. People accepted the clarion call of one Gambia, one nation, one people. We campaign with that slogan. By the time we reach the urban area, the coalition was cemented. The people were organized. The people were focused. We were not divided by political parties. We were not divided by ethnicity. We were not divided by religion. We were united by our citizenship and our determination to effect regime change. And that happened on the 2nd of December. The announcement came. Victory was attained. The incumbent was convinced that he was defeated. That is why he accepted the results. But in a week later, when you come face to face with powerlessness, you will begin to see the danger of being weak. But he changed his mind. At that time, the fundamental question was, should we confront the incumbent and remove him with force? Or should we adopt another method? Ensure peace. Eventually, Gambians were convinced that if we are aware and organized, what we want we'll get. And therefore, to be organized, we must agree on the method we are going to use to effect the change that was necessary. We told the Gambian people that here is a constitution which is inviolable. Here was the verdict of the people which is inviolable. Therefore, our duty was to defend these two things. We must defend the verdict of the people. We must defend the verdict of the constitution. That was the basis of legitimacy, which had to be supported internationally. 
We therefore told the Gambian people that according to our constitution, election must take place within three months before the end of the term, five-year term of the incumbent. Therefore, if we have election, the incumbent will still have a residue of term left. We told the Gambian people that we've calculated that and the end of his term will be the 18th of January 2017. That there was no need for anybody to go in the street. That he had legitimate authority to direct the troops wherever he so desired. That everybody should prepare for the 18th of January 2017 that when that day comes, he must leave. If he fails to leave, he will be a rebel. And anybody who supports him after that day would also be considered a rebel. That therefore, the Gambians should wait for that day. Because all of us accepted that day, we became united in waiting for that day. We told the same thing to ECOWAS, same thing to AU, same thing to United Nations. The international community also accepted that agenda and all of them waited for 18th January 2017. We didn't stop there. We decided to talk to the security forces in the Gambia to tell them that the verdict of the people has to be respected, the verdict of the constitution has to be respected. And if they fail to respect it and protect one that has gone <coughs> against those two verdicts, they will also be rebels and they will throw our country into war. And they will never be able to escape from that war. They also accepted that on the 18th, they will not support unconstitutionality. They will not support illegitimacy. They will support legitimate authority. We continued repeat that over and over again. All of you knew the state of the Gambia. Troops were in the street. We told people don't antagonize them. Even if you can do something for them, do something for them so that we will not have any skirmishes. But people had bought all the cutlasses. They even had identification tags. And people were ready for civil war. That was the state of the gap. So I'm not talking about closing airspace. They were not in the gap yet. That's why they're talking about closing airspace. We knew what we were confronting. So consequently, we stabilized the people, the minds of the people. And on the 19th, President Barrow decided to assume office. But it was done on Gambian territory in Dhaka. So what was left is the contest of legitimacy. A government owing its origin and legitimacy from the will of the people and the dictates of the constitution and a government which intended to violate the dictates of the Constitution and disregard the verdict of the people. So that is why those days became very crucial because some felt that they should attack because ECOWAS has surrounded the borders, air, land, and sea. And some felt that the only solution was war. But those of us who were inside, who knew what we had done to create an architecture for peace, asked them to continue.
for the negotiation to conclude. We have seen that on the 21st of January 2017, leaders of the coalition were called, and many of them called me. And I had to go to the airport to tell the supporters of the coalition that they should leave the airport so that Jammu will leave the country. The security forces were there. Economic forces were not there. The security forces did not use tear gas to disperse the people. They called us to go and talk to the people. That reflected the change of power. That the person who was in the state house was no longer in command of the security forces of the country. And consequently, when we did that, he left the country. And President Barrow assumed full power. To ensure that there was no looting, there was no destruction of, of government properties, the security chiefs were asked to assume their responsibilities and the civil service to assume their responsibilities so that there will be no vacuum for somebody to think that anything else could be done. So the questions you have asked, it is through unity that we had strength to effect change. It is through unity that we can also have the strength to build a country. But the type of national reconciliation that people are talking about is that Johannes and Mandinkas and Wolofs and Serapules are beginning to do this and that. So there is tribalism, there is this. So how do we put an end to all this tribalism? This is what I hear people talking about. So even reconciliation uh, meetings have been held in that country between certain groups, Foyi, etc. I have never been part of those meetings and I will never be part of those meetings. Why? <coughs> the reconciliation is not about tribes and religions. The unity is about sovereign Gambia being built to be sovereign Gambia and the sovereign Gambian people being built to be sovereign Gambian people. You cannot have a new Gambia without a new Gambian. You cannot have a new Gambian unless each Gambian recognizes that power belongs to him, he and her, they own the country. And that there is no minority in that country. There is no majority in that country. There is only the Gambian person, the Gambian people. That is what must be recognized, because that is the truth. Just now, and I'm dealing with the issue of reconciliation. And the rest, I'm sure I'll deal with them very fast. I'll soon conclude so that we can have questions and answers. We can go into a local language if you so desire. Just now, you, you heard what is happening in the United States. They are talking about white supremacists. They are talking about racists. They are talking about transmen. But I believe they are helping those people by using those terms. We must call a spade a spade. I provoked some young people in Stockholm, of course, they, they had to respond. I told them that there is no racism in the world. There is no Islamism in the world. There is no tribalism in the Gambia. But they didn't say anything. After a while, I said, I said all these things and you want me to, 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 to go away with it? You are not going to challenge me? 
Of course, a young, bold lady girl challenged me and said, all this discrimination that is taking place, everywhere we go, people call us all this name. You're saying there is no racism. In no, 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 there is racism. And I told them that there is only one human race. There is only one human race. Secondly, what color was he? From which continent did he originate? If you belong to something, you must protect that. Who died? in this attack in the United States. Somebody who is of the same color of skin as the perpetrators of the violence. So you are called what you protect. But Hitler did not protect the Europeans and those who share the same and continent with him. So which race was he protected? Even if we decided to divide white and black into races. So clearly we should call people for what they are. They are bigots. If you wish call them terrorists, if you wish call them haters, call them the name that fits them and separate them from the human beings. Those people are not human beings. Separate them from the human race and call them whatever you wish to call them so that they belong to whoever they should belong to. The same thing with the issue of tribe. I have emphasized that we are now a nation We belong to Gambia and we are citizens of the Gambia. Each of us one vote. We are equal in sovereignty, male and female. So when we select a government, he's a Mandinka, he's a Jola, he's a Saroholi, and that person in the state house, and you are a messenger, you are a driver, and your grade is grade one, and you are receiving less than $1,000 a month because that person in the state house who belongs to this ethno-linguistic group of yours, will you go to the accountant and say, pay me more money than a driver should receive? Of course not. You will receive the same salary that the others will receive. And at the end of the day, you will suffer the same consequences. So out of ignorance, you will say that that person, my that person, is me who is there. But in actual reality, you do not belong to the same world. You are living in poverty and you die in poverty and that person is living in prosperity for as long as he or she desires. So therefore, a person can belong by accident, to an ethno-linguistic group, to a gender, or by choice to a religion. But that does not elevate that person to live a prosperous life in liberty by so belonging to such a group. If we want liberty and prosperity, then we must become political. We must accept that we have a state. We must accept that the state must have policies that must be implemented so that we can have schools, we can have hospitals, we can have roads, we can have infrastructure of all sorts so that we can live in prosperity. Therefore, the president we elect has to have a cabinet and receive our revenue and provide us with the services we need. And when you go to a hospital, irrespective of your origin, 
You want a doctor who can cure you. You do not say, well, I want a doctor that comes from my ethno-linguistic group, that comes from my religion, that comes from my gender. You want a doctor who can cure you. And when you go to school, you want a teacher who can teach your child. The engineer who will provide the electricity and water supply you need, build the houses we need, the roads we need. That's what we need. So, my caution. Science has said, if a particular thing is repeated unremittingly, you can make truth to appear to be falsehood and falsehood to appear as true. There are some people who would want, out of opportunism, to move others to support their cause so that they can have power that they can use for their own interests against the interests of the very people whom they mobilize. And if you continue to insult each other, Maninkas this, Jonas that, Wolof that, Sarakuli that, that is where it's going to be maintained in our own thinking. And as a result, eventually, that will become the reality. Because as you talk about other people, they also get intimidated, frustrated, and eventually feel that, well, as a group, we must combine also to use the same language against the other. That is what we avoided to form a coalition. That is what we must avoid now in building a nation. So we are calling on all Gambians here and abroad to begin the campaign of one Gambia, one nation, one people. And those who are conscious of your sovereignty, continue on that cause. Leave others behind. Eventually their cause will fail. Because no one will be able to become anything in the Gambia without the people of the Gambia. And again, the last majority of people are united to build a sovereign Gambia with a sovereign people. Anyone who attempts anything else will fail. So if we want national reconciliation, let us accept today that we are a sovereign Gambian people. And now we see and recognize the sovereignty of our fellow citizens. And we will cooperate with them to build the Gambia that is fit for us to live in. The second aspect of the issue. We must bear in mind what democracy is all about. <coughs> you have sovereign power and you have your vote. But you cannot alone change your country. So we must have freedom of association. The citizen has freedom. And the freedom and rights constitute right to life, right to liberty, free from interference in, in your privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom to belong to any religion, freedom to belong to any political party and assemble. These are all freedoms that you own. So as a result, people can belong to political parties. For what reason? So that the parties will come with the policies that they will implement so that we have better schools, hospitals, roads, jobs, and better quality of life. That's why we elect people. And that's why we support political parties. We must know what they intend to do so that we vote on the basis of informed choice. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. I went to Norway. I was informed that before Norway discovered its oil, it was a fishing nation. <coughs> Gambia, less than two million people. And look at our ocean. So if you continue to give license to industrial fishing boats and they take the fish and take care of it elsewhere, 
and the money comes to them, of course, the ocean will not benefit us. If we give license to fishing boats who will land their fish in the Gambia, of course, jobs will be created in the Gambia. If we sell it abroad, of course, foreign exchange will come to the Gambia and it will be in our reserves. And with the expansion of that wealth, you'll be able to build schools and hospitals and roads and infrastructure. For how many years, Kadong, Batokung Kusanya, mining was taking place? So that wealth belongs to the Gambian nation. Whatever method you're going to utilize until that mining takes place, you sell it, and that money is put into our, our coffers, it becomes sovereign national wealth. You can build schools, hospitals, and places <coughs> like Sanya, you can have a local, local government structure where anything that is taken from a particular village, you, that village must also have royalties. So that part of that wealth will go back to that village for its development. Whether it's borehole for water, whether it's an electric uh, pole that you're putting putting in the village so that it will transmit electricity, everything, royalties must be paid so that that village will utilize that for its development. That's how you develop a country. Look at our oil production. We produce grounds. We have an establishment capable of transforming the grounds into oil. We're importing over $600 million a worth of oil, edible oil, which we can produce. If we produce $600 million, would have been in our coffers. And jobs would be created for our people. With all that money coming from different sectors, you can process our, our, our somebody was just telling me, our mangoes, our fruits, into, into drinks, soft drinks. ITC was established to increase the capacity of our Nama, Nama Kato to produce milk, more milk. Where is ICT today? And experts were there. One of our colleagues who passed away was even there, Dr. Omar Tun. And he used to produce all this yogurt in the community and sell it in the community at a low scale. All that we can produce for us. And it goes into the store, we can even export them. So essentially what I'm talking about, look at the rice. The rice we consume, 200,000 tons, importing 140,000 tons plus. What we are importing, if we produce, we'll be pumping 1.9 billion into our economy, into our GDP. Processing it means jobs. Selling it means foreign exchange. This is how other nations develop. It's not a miracle. It's utilizing intelligence. We must be thinkers. We must be inventors. We must be creators. We must be builders. That's how a civilization is built. All these countries were poor countries. Because humankind starts from lack of technology. Technology has to be produced, has to be created. So in short, democracy is about each citizen gaining the maturity of how a nation is governed. Understand your executive, understand your legislature, understand your judiciary, understand the roles they are to play in society and take your responsibility as someone who can elect or be elected to a post to run your society. <coughs> That's what democracy is all about. And citizenship education should be in our school system. From nursery school, you begin to understand that you are a person who belongs to a nation. That's where you defeat sectionalism. For the person to know that he is, he is a person but also a social being that belongs to a nation and is growing to occupy a division of labor in society. I remember in our Nyakoy School, 
The children used to be asked to prepare their minds for the future. What do you want to be? I want to be president. I want to be a nurse. I want to be this. I want to be that. So they start talking about what they want to be in the future. All this is part of socialization. At a very early age, you can give the person a perspective that he, she is going to grow from being a small child into an adult because he or she is living with parents. It depends on your education system. You can role model the children in democracy. They can even take leadership position. Who, who is a child, who, who is a bully, who is a child, who can help the other children. You say, okay, let's elect that child to, to, to take care of the rest, to look after the rest. All these are leadership qualities that you can start building in human beings at a very early age. But that can only be done with an organized society. And that is what democracy must yield because you have a choice of leadership. So therefore, democracy is inconceivable without the sovereign citizen understanding his or her power as a citizen. And know that might, as a very important person, must be exercised to ensure that we have the type of leadership that will serve the interests of the people. So the starting point of democracy is for each sovereign citizen to see himself, herself, as a very important person. Not that you become a minister, then you become important. You become a president, you become important. Who creates the minister? Who creates the president? Who creates the national assembly member? It is you. It is your vote. And that is the starting point of democracy. And today, each Gambian must recognize that the sovereignty of the country resides in him. That's what the Constitution says in, in, in chapter 1. Subsection 2, it says sovereignty resides in the people of the Gambia. And nobody has authority to be a president, to be a national assembly member, <laughs> unless your authority is derived from the consent of the people. And it added that authority must be exercised for no other purpose but to promote your general welfare and prosperity. Then nobody is fit to govern that country who is incapable of delivering general welfare and prosperity. That's what you are told by the Constitution. That's the dictate of the Constitution. But you must safeguard that by your decision as a citizen. You must accept responsibility to be the architect of your own destiny. You must accept responsibility to be the commander of your own destiny. You are in control. And we must never lose control again because the change has been effected after 52 years. You brought about the change. Now you are in control. You must never allow yourself to lose control again. Then Gambia will become consolidated as a democratic country. Development, I've already told you how it must be brought. Development depends in the Gambia on three pillars. Agriculture contributes about 21% of GDP. Industry, about 14%. GDP and the 66 percent goes or 65 percent goes to services. But the services we have, where is telecommunication, where is electricity, where it is buying and selling, importing and selling goods, would not employ too many people. The bulk of the population live in the rural area 60 percent 40 percent in the urban area but you do not have industries to employ people that is why many people are leaving the gambia to go abroad in search of better means of existence but we know what is happening these countries where our people used to go are saying that no we cannot take this search not everybody can come 
Because all over the place, people are coming. And therefore, they are erecting borders, and they are strengthening security apparatus in Libya, etc., so that those people will bar people from entering. Now, development is indispensable. We must know that Gambia is wealthy, but our problem is the poverty of leadership and the poverty of policy. In agriculture, vast majority have family farms. You will hear certain people telling you, in many of these countries, only 3% of the population are engaged in agriculture. But the reason why that development model came into being is because industries develop, services develop to absorb the rest of the population. So you do not need all that population with machinery in, 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 in rural agriculture. But in our own part of the world, the vast majority of people own family farms. And if you remove them from the land and give it to just 3%, obviously there are no industries to absorb them. There are no services to absorb them. They will starve and die. So that's not the system that can work in the country. What you need is to give those cooperative banking, give those family farms, fertilizer seed <coughs> and farming implement to improve the agricultural production. Then you begin the processing of what they are producing. Go to the women gardeners, provide them seed fertilizer and farming implements. Let them grow the tomatoes and the uh, onions and all the things that you need. Then come and buy it directly from the farm. Therefore, nothing will be ruined in their hands. And they will not go and occupy the streets selling these vegetables and fruits. Everything will be organized. The retail will be organized. And that is job for many people. So those cooperatives that buy this can come and supply those who are retailing. They can export. That's how you bring about development. Our minerals harness put into our, 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 our coffers to expand our industries and our infrastructure. That's how we can bring about development. It is policy that will ultimately lead to development. Finally, that is why no one should believe that our state is hopeless. We have a future, but we must build that future. We must build it with cooperation with the rest of the world. I've met many authorities in my district, and constantly what I've emphasized to them is that the Gambian population and all the populations in their countries should be seen as a resource not as liability. Because people only concentrate on the movement of people, but they are not concentrating on the movement of goods, on the movement of capital, on the movement of profit. And if you have, want to have a balanced understanding of the world, you must see how profit move, how goods move, how people move. And if you do a cost-benefit analysis, you will see that Europe and the countries whose economies are developed are not getting an unfair share of the wealth of the world. So then how do we balance the world to ensure prosperity on all sides? Because that is the solution. Instead of pumping billions to upkeep security machinery, you look at all the, I'll use Gambia as an example, all the Gambians in Denmark, in Sweden, in all these Nordic countries. Many of their children are becoming educated. They have many capacities. They themselves have many capacities. If we have homes that are organized, 
we will ensure that Gambians will team up here and establish enterprises in our country. The young can be supported even in terms of development cooperation to have small and medium term medium sized enterprises in, in the country and those who would have migrated could team up with them so that they work and produce. That will be productive. We will export some of these things into this part of the world. We will be able to consume some of their technology. So therefore, you can have a world that is growing on a win-win basis. That is how we can change the world. But if that part of the world continues as it is, without the leadership and the policies that can facilitate economic <coughs> development, our consumption will cont cont contract. Therefore, in this part of the world, the sale of their machinery, whatever, will also contract. And at the end of the day, you will end up with a world depression. All of us will become losers. So it is therefore important that we have leaders who can articulate our concerns not only in a narrow sense, but in a universal sense, so that all of us will be awakened to understand that we have a duty not only to our countries, but to the world as a whole. That is absolutely essential. So therefore, my recommendation to those of you who are here is that this is the time to take yourselves very serious. You are part of two worlds. Therefore, you must be organized to handle two worlds. As for our society, your organization should be able to meet and come up with concrete recommendations to the government of the Gambia, its parliament, what you need as support so that you will prepare yourself for this society and for our society. For our society, it is your right as Gambians to vote. Just like others are voting. And you can demand that right. And the government should deliver. You have right to demand that the constitution of the Gambia be changed. So that even if you have dual citizenship, you will still have the right to be a minister, have the right to be, be stand as presidential candidate without any <coughs> barrier. It is just a constitutional provision. You can demand for that right. You can demand that that country and this country or any other country should cooperate to safeguard your interests. Some of you are becoming older. I know some elderly citizen of Britain who come to the Gambia, buy properties and stay there because it's easier with the income they are receiving to stay in such a country. Why not Gambians? who have gone abroad, becoming elderly, they too can go back. And that country should be able to provide housing facilities, land which, are, which is planned. All this must be planned. It will not drop from the sky. It's an agreement. So that the pension they receive could be paid to them at home. And obviously, they will live better lives at home. <coughs> All these are issues that could be discussed to facilitate that development. Some of you who are here needing scholarships because of your preparation to come and deal with the brain drain at home, could through negotiation be positioned so that you can have the type of education with the commitment that you'll come back to save that society, to empower it with knowledge so that it will facilitate its development. All these are things that are possible. The same thing with small, medium-sized enterprises through support, through development <coughs> cooperation, would 
constitute an asset to the economies of these countries. It is my conviction that if we work together, you will also be able to demand from the states where you are in, in terms of ambassadors, so that at least it will be easier for you to be able to get your visas. All these issues are issues that could be resolved through bilateral cooperation between countries. Many of you are worried about the transition in the Gambia. And we have seen that you've mentioned about transitional justice. When a country changes, you have an old dispensation that without doubt would have committed many acts that would require remedy. Throughout the 22 years of Germany's rule, we heard about detentions without trial, disappearances without trace, many, many issues of justice. How do you handle them? We must praise the Gambian people for their maturity. Because when change occurred on the 21st of January, all those who had souls in their heart could have identified those they believed to have been the perpetrators and go and stab them, burn their houses, do anything in revenge. But that spirit of revenge was prevented because of a long process of transition where people were hearing discussions of what we should do to ensure that we have a peaceful transition. And that repeated unremittingly changed every Gambian. I remember when President Barrow was in Dakar, many people whose families were concerned about their disappearances came to me. And President Barrow was advised and immediately instruction was given that anybody who was detained without trial should be released immediately by anybody who detained them. And that started to happen. And whoever was not released, reports were given and it continued. A whole process, flurry of, of initiative for their release. Eventually, those who could not be seen, they were asked to write a petition to the Attorney General Chambers before an Attorney General was even appointed. So that the dossier will be there for the Attorney General to look at and see what form of justice will be able to address their concerns. So the people became engaged rather than taking the law into their own hands. And the Gambian people, those victims, families of victims should be commended for having the maturity to be able to wait for the state to address their concerns. And now the Attorney General Chambers have held many conferences and they are talking about to a reconciliation commission. So now it depends on the bill that will be brought to Parliament to review the content of this truth and reconciliation. And based on that, a person like me would be able to tell you what to expect. But the standard that I know to be a standard that can help us to achieve justice and reconciliation means that whatever instrument we put in place must have four elements. One, it must be substantive justice, which means that investigation must be thorough and you must be able to really identify the culprit and know that this is what had happened and this is the person who has actually done it. Two, 
Whatever process is in place must be curative. Because if you suffer, it is a sore in your chest. That sore must be healed. So whatever is done must heal the person who is the victim. But also must heal the person who also perpetrated the act. So that that person will know that justice has been done and that person will be able to repent. The third aspect, it must be a justice that is rehabilitative. It must be able to transform the individual from the hate of the perpetrator and the hate and anger of the victim to accept that this has happened, but we must move forward. We will not forget, but we will be able to forgive. Because you can even put a person life in prison and still the person will not be able to forgive that person. No matter what punishment was given. But whatever may happen, whatever the form of punishment and agreement, the person must be able to come to a point where you say, well, uh, I will not forget, but I'll be able to forgive, I'll leave on. And the last aspect is restorative justice. You must become a person who ultimately society will compensate for your suffering so that you will be able to live a better life. Not the type of justice system where you spend billions on sending a person to jail while the victim continues to live in poverty from the cradle to the grave. So it is important that as the bill comes to the National Assembly, as a National Assembly member, as a parliamentarian, uh, you can hear what I would say when I would be analyzing that bill to see whether it satisfied the four parameters that I have actually established. I believe what you've asked me to do, I have done. And I would want to congratulate you for this initiative. That Gambians are beginning to rewrite their own history. What we were known for is being docile, accepting subjugation, failing to change our nation, and hoping that others will come and change it for us. What we are now known today in the world is that we have done the impossible. We have changed a regime that the whole world thought to be so powerful that it was unchangeable to the ballot box. <coughs> and many powers on earth had felt powerless before such a regime. But we, the Gambian people, without weapons, because of the power of awareness and organization, came together and effected the change. And again, because of our awareness, decided to effect the transformation of peaceful transfer of power that the whole world is talking about. Now, we are demanding from President Barrow, from members of cabinet, from those in the judiciary and parliament, to stop using any language that will antagonize, that will separate our people, and start using a language that will unify our people and do justice that all will accept to be justice. All will see to be justice. And then proceed to try to govern this country as a transitional measure so that a foundation will be built 
that others will come to rely on to build a better Gambia. The building of a new Gambia is in our hands. But we must not rest on our laurels. Those who have the opportunity to lead must know that they have a duty to deliver. But they must also know that they do not own the country. The country belongs to her people. And her people will never go to sleep again. Because they know the danger of going to sleep. Because the ultimate consequences of going to sleep is tyranny. It's disappearances without trace. Detention without trial. And we will not accept that again. Never. Thank you for thank you very much. I mean, um, I just want to say, can we just take uh, about five minutes break? In a before we start uh, questioning you again. So, just a five minutes break. Boy. Thank you. 